As we worship together and sing the praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one thing that we cannot exclude is his amazing grace. The hymn writer wrote about that grace, describing it as grace that is greater than all our sin. I want us to sing about that this morning and then that beautiful little chorus, There is none like you. Let's sing it out to our Lord Jesus today. Well, it's been a song that if you, like me, grew up in church, you have heard uh, for a long time and uh, perhaps even a long time before you were born. One of those songs that really describes the foundation upon which we live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let's sing that and declare that as the truth of our foundation even today. Rock of ages, let's sing it.
Well, as we continue our study in Ephesians this morning, we are beginning chapter 6. Finally, we are to the last chapter of this powerful, personal little letter. And we are going to look at just the first few verses of chapter 6 today. Continue our study of how we walk and live as Christians, followers of Jesus, alive in Christ. Today, really coupled with what we talked about last Sunday at the end of chapter 5, and Paul's instructions for the father and the mother to be first uh, a godly husband and a godly wife. Today we look at Christ-centered parenting. Again, very much in line with that portrait of a Christ-centered home and marriage that we talked about last week. So, really, to save a little time this morning, let me just say that the introduction for this message is basically the message from last Sunday. Uh, now, all of that said, you're going to have to go back and, and dig into that a little bit more. But let me just kind of summarize it this way. No, Paul does not say, set a good example for your children, quote, unquote. But it is clearly implied in the verses that we studied last week that a Christ-centered marriage is the only way to produce christ centered parenting it's the only way it's the only way for a husband to love his wife as christ loves the church for a wife to submit to to surrender to her husband as to the lord that's the only way that what we read in the first few verses of chapter six will happen will work will be applicable you can look up a lot of different words of encouragement and challenge and instruction on parenting simply by typing in a few words in your favorite internet search engine. One phrase that I found in various forms actually attributed to various individuals, even Abraham Lincoln uh, is, uh, is, is given credit for this statement, maybe one of the earliest ones I could find, uh, goes something like this. The best thing that parents can do for their children is to love each other. Um, more specifically, uh, for example, Abraham Lincoln uh, is quoted as saying, the best thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Uh, it has been uh, written and quoted in more recent days in a bit more of an inclusive format, and I like that. The best thing for parents can do, can do for their children is to love one another. If I had the opportunity in the platform, I might would tweak it just a little bit to say something like this. First of all, I would say one of the best things, because I do believe this is not exclusively the best thing. I would say one of the best things that parents can do for their children, and this is how I would finish it. I would say one of the best things that parents can do for their children is to love each other as they love Jesus first. i Think back and sometimes wonder how in the world I got the words out when I got down on one knee before Michelle some 35 years ago. And I asked her a question first before the question. I said, I will always love you but I will always love Jesus more. Do you believe that? Now, I can't even remember exactly the words because I'm even nervous thinking about it. It kind of makes me nervous. She remembers it. She remembers it. I will always love Jesus first, but then I will love you. And then I asked her, I said, I said, do you believe that? And she said, yes. And then, of course, I asked the question. And she said, yes, as well. I wanted to be sure that she knew that although I would not be a perfect husband, that my desire, my first priority would be to love Jesus first and then to love her just as the scripture says, like I love the Lord. And that's the way it's got to be if we are going to have any chance of raising our children as Paul writes here in that same fashion. Listen, we know this, we see this, especially if you now have grown children, if you've even uh, had that influence on your grandchildren and nieces and nephews and you've seen them grow up before you. Parents cannot make the lifelong, life-directing decisions 
for our children. Parents cannot make those decisions for, uh, for their children as much as you would want to. Now, I do understand and I fully believe, and I am I'm very much a proponent of, despite what uh, is being uh, spewed from uh, so many uh, liberal outlets today, anti-family outlets today, but when they are young, yes, we can make some of those choices for them, and I believe that it is our biblical responsibility to do so. I mean, we, we, we teach them, we talked about walking, and we teach them where to walk and how to walk. And when they're able to reach up on the stove, we teach them that it's hot. When they discover the electrical outlets on the wall, we teach them that, that those can hurt them. It frustrates me. In fact, it breaks my heart today that parents are allowed to, to teach their children not to play with fire. But then they're told, don't you dare teach them uh, what it means to be a boy or what it means to be a girl. You let them decide. That's baloney. And a whole lot worse. We are called as parents while our children are young and, 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 and learning and growing physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to be the responsible party in their lives. Teaching them, yes, when they are young. However, just as important as helping them see and learn those right godly choices, that is that, that, that responsibility as such is for a limited time. It is. However, we must realize that just as important as the decisions we make for them when they are young is the foundation that we lay for them and that we pray and allow God to lay for them and with them that they will build on for the rest of their lives. And this gives me really a lot of clarity when I come to one of those verses that has caused a lot of confusion or at least concern that we read in the book of Proverbs. If you read along with us in Proverbs last year, you came to this verse several times, chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's caused a lot of struggle because we're not sure if we're to take that literally, figuratively, metaphorically, or somewhere in between. I believe what we're talking about this morning will give us some clarity to that verse because, yes, as we guide and instruct our children that the Scripture commands us to do as parents, we're not just teaching them things to do and things not to do. We are laying a foundation, and a foundation is being built upon which they will eventually, when they are making those choices, build upon. And even if they build upon that solid foundation with junk, and the world sweeps through and rushes through like a hurricane and blows everything down, they will not be able to escape the foundation upon which all of that was built. And they will not be able to deny what is right and what is godly. I really believe that's what Solomon was getting at because ultimately, no, we cannot make those choices just as I'm sure uh, there were uh, children in Solomon's life that disappointed him as well. So we get to this text today talking about relationships within the family, specifically between parents and their children. And I want to just read four verses this morning because it's going to take us all morning to get through just these four verses. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And he goes all the way back to Exodus. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Or wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Father, I pray that you will take these very powerful words this morning and plant them deep in our hearts. And I pray that we would not only see the way that you have called us to walk, to instruct and guide the children that you have given us that are our own and perhaps those that you have given that are around us in our community. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to walk in your steps and in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul really uh, mentions just two things in these four verses. There's not a, not a very large outline that we need to write here. The first one is specifically to children. And he talks about and he instructs here children who obey and follow the Lord. 
children who obey and follow the Lord. And it's really direct, so as such, we could just read it and move on, but I want us to see it in the light of what Paul, as we've already talked about, has already written, but also in the light of Scripture, because some would say, well, now, Paul wasn't married, Paul didn't have kids, well, neither was Jesus. So does that mean we need to ignore their words when it comes to family and parenting and children? I think not. Because we believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is good for instruction into righteousness. What do we see not only here? What do we hear not only here but all throughout the word? First and foremost, I believe what Paul is highlighting and why he addresses this. Even though he doesn't necessarily have the personal experience that we might would want. Paul is declaring here firmly, I believe children are a gift from God. Children are a gift from God. From God, One of the two psalms that we have in, in the book of Psalms that is attributed to King Solomon. A couple of the psalms that we know of are directly attributed to King Solomon. Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. Now, Solomon wrote a whole lot of other things for sure. But in the psalms, a couple of those psalms are attributed to Solomon. And one of those psalms, 127 verse 3, says this. Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Now that is a declaration worth remembering, especially in the modern age that we are in now where there, where, where there is literally a movement among young couples to live and to take all of their wealth and spend it on, them, on themselves. And they're going on social media even and bragging about the fact that they don't have children and they don't want children because children are just an inconvenience and they're just going to build, them, build their lives on themselves. And they're totally missing Psalm 127 verse 3. And Solomon's declaration, children are a gift from the Lord. And listen, I believe Paul mentions this intentionally in his letter because this was in such stark contrast to the Roman culture in which the church was, was, was growing and in so many uh, situations being persecuted. John R. W. Stott, in his commentary on Ephesians, makes this statement about the culture and how the church was so radically different. He said, this view of children in the Christian church was a radical change from the callous cruelty which prevailed in the Roman Empire, in which unwanted babies were abandoned, weak and deformed ones were killed, and even healthy children were regarded by many as a partial nuisance because they inhibited sexual promiscuity and complicated easy divorce. Now, Stott is writing about the Roman Empire, but if I didn't know better, he was writing about the United States in 2024. Wow. That's why this was so important, I believe, for Paul to say, yes, children, just like husbands, just like wives, need to be walking in step with God's word. Children need to be obeying and following the Lord. And as they do that, they carry that out in their relationship with their parents. Listen, goodness, I don't know where I would be. I don't know where so many of us would be without that landmark foundational truth that we learned as children. We learned it in a song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus Loves the little children of the world. And I believe Paul is affirming that here in this letter as well. Secondly, we need to know not only are children a gift from God, but Jesus loved the children. One of those classic memorable days with Jesus and his disciples where they thought they had it all figured out. And the crowds were coming to Jesus and the moms and dads and the families were coming to Jesus and the children were just running around, um, obviously, you know, kind of uh, from their perspective, getting in the way. And, and some of them were trying to get to Jesus and even some of the parents were trying to bring their children. The disciples said, no, Jesus doesn't have time for this. And what did Jesus say? How did he respond? We read it in all three of the synoptic gospels. Let's read it out of Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 14. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant with them. And he said, permit the children to come to me 
Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Why? Because Jesus loved the children. Children are important. So where does that bring us? Well, it brings us back to the command, the instruction that Paul gives when he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And of course, we're connecting this to the theme of last week and ultimately the verse that we'll read in just a moment directed toward fathers and I believe parents as a whole. We need to understand this biblical parenting requires obedience. Despite much of the politically correct nonsense that is being poured out into our, uh, into our culture today. Biblical parenting requires obedience. Four places in the scripture. This is not just a, a New Testament thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. It is a biblical thing. And I want to give you four uh, snapshots through the scripture very quickly that confirm this and affirm this for us today. In the law, all the way back in the law, it's a command. It's a command. Paul, in fact, acknowledges this and quotes this from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. I've often kind of joked about that and said, yeah, you honor your father and mother uh, or you won't live very long. I mean, and I, I really don't think that's what it means. When he says, and your days will be prolonged in the land, anytime we talk about uh, Israel and their days in the land, it's more than just physical. It's spiritual. even has an eternal context as well. It's kind of like I remember telling my kids as they were growing up, challenging them and instructing them to make godly choices with their friends. And I would tell them, I would say, you know, when you make those choices that uh, that, that, that go contrary to what your friends might be making. They, 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 won't, they won't necessarily like you for it, but they will remember you for it. They will remember you. I believe that's what we're reading here in this command. Oh, no, there's, there's still struggles today in the Middle East and all across the land, all, all around the world with, with, with people... And, and children and, and adults walking or not walking in step with God's word. But listen, when you do, despite the persecution that Jesus even promised his disciples, they would receive, oh, you will be remembered and you will shine like a city set on a hill. Yes, in the law, it's a command. In the prophets, we move on into the prophets. We'll read from Isaiah chapter 1, the, the very earliest verses uh, God makes a, a, what we'll just simply call a tragic comparison here to what it looks like when this breaks down, when children do not obey. Of course, the, the, the image in Isaiah as well as several other uh, of, of the prophecies that we read in the Old Testament that the, the children are, are, are Israel and Judah, God's people. And so much of the prophecies that we read in Isaiah and Jeremiah and so many of the others is because of their what? Because of their obedience or their disobedience? Because of their disobedience. That's right. And, we, and from, I mean, from the get-go, verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 1, we see this tragic comparison to what happens when this breaks down. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Wow, what a tragic comparison when he says the ox and the donkey will obey their master better than you have obeyed me. Wow. That's how important it was to God. And that's why the judgment came upon his people like it did. In Proverbs, we've already been to Proverbs. We'll go back again. In Proverbs, we read and see the importance of this the relationship between children and parents. In Proverbs, it's an urgent challenge. It's an urgent challenge. Again, from the get-go, from the very earliest verses that Solomon 
writes or dictates or however uh, this, this came to us. Oh, I'm so glad it did. Verse 8 of Proverbs chapter 1. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath on your head like a crown and ornaments about your neck like a gold necklace. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And he goes on from there and talks about the dangers and the snares that come along with that. If you watch any sort of professional athletics uh, sometimes you'll see these athletes. In fact, I even saw a, a documentary on, on this guy who makes these necklaces. I'm, uh, I guess as far as professional athletics go, I'm, I'm a, a, a greater fan of professional baseball than anything else. I enjoy watching it, I suppose, more than any other professional sport. And sometimes you'll see these baseball players uh, when they're, when they're you know, out and about, and they'll have these big gold chains on with a big necklace. It'll have their, and a big, it'll have their number on it. Man, these things are like solid gold. There's a guy, they did a documentary, and there's a guy that makes these specifically for these professional baseball players. It might have their number, it might have their nickname or something like that on it. Why do they do that? Well, they want everybody to see it. They're like, I am the man. And what does he say here? Now, think about that. If my mom would say, or dad would say, I'm just gaudy. You know, think about that gaudy necklace. But what does he say about obedience? Solomon says about obedience to parents. He said it's, he said it's, like, a, it's like ornaments. It's like a beautiful necklace around your neck. So, so that others can see. I mean, that's why you wear a necklace. I mean, yes, it does. it's worn to enhance you know, your own beauty, and it does, but then it's for others to see as well. What a challenge. But then back to the Gospels, back to Jesus again. And Jesus here, instead of making what we saw in Isaiah as a tragic comparison, Jesus makes us a kingdom comparison. A kingdom comparison. In Matthew 18, verse 1 Matthew writes, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Isn't, isn't that just wild that here Jesus was teaching them and showing them firsthand what it was to be a servant? And they kept wanting to know who was the most important, who was the greatest. But instead of just you know, smacking them on the head, what did he do? I, I, I almost imagine he just maybe even sat down. Because he called a child to himself and set him before them. And he said, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Which echoes what we read just a moment ago when he called the children to himself, really. And look at verse 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom comparison to today? It's the same thing that Paul is writing to the Ephesians and the children there in the church saying, children, obey your parents. Humble yourselves before the godly leadership of your parents. And you see, again and again and again, we must remember, we must be convinced that this framework for obedience must be taught at home. The foundation is built more at home or it is not built more at home than anywhere else why why well i don't want to be negative all morning but I, I would be remiss if i didn't say it again why this is so important it's because our school systems so many today our school systems our medical systems our political systems today are doing everything they can to take that control away from the parents to whom this responsibility was given by god now, I'm not saying that, 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 that schools are not important and doctors are not important and politicians are not important, but they are not the ones whom God designated to build the foundation of faith and morality in our children. It begins at home. It must begin at home. So let me just make a couple of direct statements to children this morning. First of all, younger children, under the care and the provision of your parents. While you are under the care and provision of your parents, you are to honor and obey them as you obey the Lord first. I'll, I'll, I'll dig that apart just a little bit in just a moment, but not much. While under the care 
and the provision of your parents. The Bible is clear. Children are to obey their parents. But even as he says here, we must say, in the Lord, for this is right. But I would also make a a challenge to adult children this morning. Now, we're all children one way or another. Some of us still have our parents with us. So I would make this statement especially to you. After you are released from the care and the provision of your parents, you are, I believe, biblically bound to still honor them with your words, with your actions, just as you would the Lord Jesus. Jesus Jesus scolded, strongly scolded the Pharisees one time because they uh, had created loopholes uh, in, in the law, basically, to where somebody could say, they could come and say, well, I have this much money, but I, 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 I want to declare it as, as devoted to the Lord. And the reason they were doing that is so they wouldn't have to spend it on their aging parents. And Jesus said, nope, nope. Now, I said I would dig into that first one, especially for just a moment. And, and I'm going to do it just very briefly because we need to move on. Because a lot of times when a statement like this is made, kind of like the, the wives and the husbands thing, that somebody will say, well now, well, now what about this situation? Or what if this is going on? And that's why I make it very clear, just as the Scripture does, that we are to love the Lord first. I don't believe the Bible ever calls us to do anything in a relationship with someone else that would, that would put us in disobedience with the Lord. Now, again, that, uh, that has the potential for a lot of scenarios. I, I talk, I, I've talked to individuals about, about the sanctity of human life and about why I believe the Bi- Bible is completely pro-life and, yes, anti-abortion, depending on how you want to say it. And so often somebody say, well, what, if, what about this scenario? Or what about this? Here's what, here's what I've discovered. Most often when somebody chases the what-if scenarios, they are usually, it's usually coming from a desire to disobey the Word. When someone starts chasing the what-if scenarios, just like somebody might say, well, Paul wasn't married, Paul didn't have kids, so why do I have to do this? When we start chasing the what-if scenarios, we are looking for a way to disobey God's Word. Now you say, that's harsh. Now that's just the Word. That's just the Word. The Bible says as children, we must obey our parents as the Lord. But the instruction is also very clear for parents. And maybe we should have done this backwards like we did last Sunday to set the context for how children should be obeying the Lord because ultimately children should be obeying their parents and the Lord because they have parents who love and lead them to the Lord. And that's what verse 4 is all about. When he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. He's talking about parents who love and lead them to the Lord. Warren Wearsby in his commentary on Ephesians writes it this way, similar to what Stott said. In Paul's day, the father had supreme authority over the family. We know, we understand, and this, this causes a lot of grief from, you know, when uh, people read the Bible uh, and say, well, you know, that was all patriarchal society, you know, and they didn't care about women and all that. Well, yes, true. The culture of the day was patriarchal. In, in Paul's day, the father had supreme authority over the family. I believe that's why he's giving this very strong direction to the fathers. When a baby was born into a Roman family, for example, it was brought out and laid before the father. If he picked it up, it meant he was accepting it into the home. But if he did not pick it up, he meant the child was rejected. It could be sold, given away, or just put out of the house and die by exposure. So it goes to reason why Paul was giving this word directly to the fathers. But there are other times in Paul's instruction that he does speak of parents. He does use a word that is all-inclusive. Parents. We have a choice today. We have authority. The Bible gives parents authority. Yes. But we have a choice of either lording, L-O-R-D, lording our authority over our children or leading them. We can lord that authority or we can lead them with that authority. See, we have this Western mindset of, of the urban cowboy riding on his horse, driving the cows, woo, you know, whipping that, whipping that, uh, that, that rope and firing that pistol and making those cows go wherever we want them to go. You say, that's a weird illustration. Well, no, not really, because that's the mindset that we have today. You don't believe me? You just go walk around at Walmart and listen to parents talk to their kids. 
Mm, I have to bite my tongue walking up and down those aisles sometime because I know I've messed up along the way too. But no, the image here is, is of the Middle Eastern shepherd who walks up into the corral where all of the sheep have been gathered for the night and all he has to do is whatever his call is and he begins to walk and guess what happens? All of his sheep begin to follow. Why? Because he loves them. He protects them. He's willing to lay down his life for them and they know it. They know it. That's what Paul is calling us to do here and he uses a powerful picture. He says we have the choice of of provoking them to anger. Don't provoke them to anger. The word that he uses is literally connected to the Greek word where we get the word orgy, which is just a, a, a flurry of emotion and passion. Over in Colossians, which we've talked about before, it's kind of an m- echo, almost a mirror letter of Ephesians. In Colossians 3.21, he uses the word exasperate. Don't exasperate your children. What's he talking about here? He's talking about poking, prodding, and pushing out of selfish ambition or even anger. Driving the cows instead of leading the sheep. He said, I don't do that. Well, I pray you haven't. But I tell you one of the ways I see it so often. And I see parents trying to live out their their dreams of of, of, of fame and and success through their children and and performance-related sports and activities now I'm not saying don't get your kids involved in dance and sports but listen I pray you would do what Michelle and I tried our best to do all the years along the way and to ask him is this something you want to do now we've often said listen we believe you're good at this We, we can see we can see these talents and abilities in you and we would love for you to give this a try and especially when they did We, of course, challenge them to do their best and often would say things like, now listen, if you're going to start this this year, you're going to have to do it the whole year. You're not going to quit right in the middle just because it gets tough. But then when that time came, perhaps for them to try to decide if they wanted to do it again, we would say, now is this what you want to do? You're doing great. We really believe this is something you're good at. But is this something you want to do? Oh, listen, they've made whole TV series that just, 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 I can't watch them. Well, these moms that, that are pushing their kids, and, and I'm not picking on moms today, but this is just one we see this because it's on TV, and they push their kids into these beauty pageants, and then the moms get in a fight, and then the kids are crying over here because they just want to go to McDonald's and get ice cream. I think that's what he's talking about when he's talking about provoking, prodding, pushing your children out of self-admission or even anger. I believe it also involves inconsistent discipline, and uncompassionate communication. Now that's a, that's a whole focus on the family session right there. Yeah, I understand, yeah. But I believe that is such a factor, especially in our world today. Again, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not saying that it's not biblical for both parents to work, but because perhaps both parents are working, or even just the difference in personalities. Listen, this is something Michelle and I have struggled with over the years because our personalities are very different and we've had to be very intentional and we've not always done it well being consistent on the same page with our communication and our discipline. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's important. And Sometimes we learn it a little bit late. But I believe that's so very real when he talks about provoking your children to wrath. Obviously, physical absence and emotional disconnection. Again, please hear me. If you were raised by a single parent, if you are a single parent right now, that does not make you any less in God's eyes. But the challenge is greater. In church, I believe this is where we come in and play even a more important role. Not to scold, not to ostracize, not to say, well, you just, need to, you, you just need to get all your ducks in a row. We need to be coming alongside. We need to be doing what we're going to see here in just a second and, and nurturing and admonishing these children and these single parents as well because the physical absence and emotional disconnection will, will crack that foundation. And it, it may be that parents stay married, but you know, if, 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 they're, if they're pouring their lives into their own job and into their own work, and you may even have seen this in your life or in the lives of your children, if you walk down that road. Yeah, yeah. 
That's provoking your children to wrath. What are we called to do? Oh, we are called ultimately to lead them, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Leading them to the Lord. How do we do that? Very quickly. Very quickly. We've gone a long time on this. He says bring them up. The word there is the same word that we read back in chapter 5 verse 29 where, where Paul encouraged the, uh, the, the men to, to, to nourish their own bodies so that they could take care of their wives, to take care of themselves. That's the same word here when he says bring them up. It's the same word to nourish. It means to feed. Nourish them. How? Well, he said bring them up in the nurture and admonition. That word nurture means teaching and admonition means warning, teaching, and warning. Well, do you feel, or have you felt inadequate as a parent? <laughs> Join the club. Join the club. Thought about a few as I thought back to the Bible. Adam and Eve, listen, one of their boys killed his brother. Abraham and Sarah, my goodness, their children still don't get along. <laughs> Eli's sons, man, they worked in the temple and they were wicked. David had a man killed so he could have his wife. Oh, Joseph and Mary, now they were good parents. Oh, really? Man, when, when Jesus was 12, they lost him for three days. <laughs> Don't you think they felt like awful parents? God, you've given us the Messiah and we've lost him. Wow. The Bible does not say that you must be a perfect child or a perfect parent. But it does say that if we are going to do it the right way, then we're going to have to do it his way. We're going to have to do it his way. Hear the words of Solomon, another imperfect parent. One more time. Back to Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor do so in vain that build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. We're going to do it right. We've got to do it his way. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the challenge of your word today. And Lord, I simply pray. We all fall into the category of children. A lot of us fall into the category as parents. Some grandparents, even great-grandparents and beyond. I pray today we would see and hear again the challenge of your word that our relationship with you first directly affects our relationship with each other, especially in the home, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, and as a child. So that relationship with you must be first, must be priority. So I pray today, Lord, more than anything else, Whatever category, whatever stage of life we might find ourselves in, that would be first and foremost today. That we would say, oh God, I want to love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, and all of my strength. And I want to follow Jesus with my, with my everything, with my all. Father, I thank you for that call once again today, to love you first, to teach, to transmit that love through our homes today. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.